And then, uh, and I had a bunch of other things like that that I would say. And I would joke around in class. We'd make pigtails. And, uh, you know, the pigtail is how you're attaching to the power line. Well, you know, there needs to be a separation in the line because you're going to go to two different places. And I'd be like, okay, you want to split the line to about six inches. And if you don't know what six inches is, reach into your pants and pull out a dollar bill. And, uh, and that's how, that's six inches, right? So they'd be like, oh. And then, but it would be funny because I'd walk around class and I'd see somebody and I can remember, because I'm, again, I'm, I treat everybody the same and I, and, and, and I would just joke with all of them. But I can remember one, pick up a guy's pigtail, black guy. And it was like this. And I pick it up and I look it up and I'm holding a class and I'm looking at this thing and everybody's looking at me and I look at him and I said, you know, I would expect it a lot more from a black man. <laughs> so, but, you know, so that kind of shit, but nobody cared. It was like, it was fun. You know, we're talking about cops, law enforcement, people that, you know, you better be thick skinned if you're gonna show up here. So let's talk about your career with DEA. Yeah. So you get out of you get out of the army and you start with DEA in '93 and you retire with DEA in 2021. I, I always called you a tech agent, but what was that's, your what was your official? Well, that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. for every call, yeah, yeah tech, tech agent, whatever. The, the um, investigative specialist. So what what were your duties? What were your duties, and why did you decide to go that route? Um, well, I had skills, and uh, I think that that was where I was. Um, I could best uh, benefit the, the agency. Um, the, uh, you know, it's kind of like the thing when you've got, you know, you might have, you know, like, uh, I don't know what we had at the time, 20 or 30 agents in the division and one of me. Yeah. You know, or two of me. Right. You know, so that, so it was, a, it was a, it was a position where you're, you're, there are not very many, you know, and, and even, and a couple of the people that we had when I started, were not that great to begin with, you know, the uh, helmet wit, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and another guy, you know, so um, I, I don't know. I just, I felt like that this was where there was, uh, you know, the, the greatest opportunity to make a difference. And I had to figure that out as I went. So what, what were your jobs? What did you end up doing? Well, initially, I mean, I did, I did a bunch of stuff initially till I kind of learned my way around. I mean, there was a while where, um, well, you know, if there was if there was something in DEA that was fucked up, if there was a problem in a division, something that needed work on, then I would migrate to that and try to make a difference. Like, for example, for a while there, I mean, I did a ton of radio stuff because nobody was doing it. People couldn't talk on the radios. Radios didn't work. You know, comms sucked. And I know I know how vitally important comms are to a mission. So I did a bunch of radio programming. I traveled around the division. I'd go to offices and say, hey. You know what's wrong, and I would try to fix that shit. Try to make it better, and uh, and 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 I liked the traveling. I liked getting around and uh, meeting meeting all these people. So uh, I did that. I did that for a while, and uh, and it it was good. I felt like I was I was making a difference. And then um, with things, you know, then then we had the you know we had pole cams. Pole cams were just starting to come out. Microwave equipment. And, uh, and it, I mean, it's just like really old shit. And I think in the division, we had like six transform, big old trans, they look like a transformer, but they're actually a camera, a microwave camera that had to transmit to a receiver. And, um, nobody was really dealing with it. And uh, it was the kind of thing where we would have to get, uh, utilities to try to hang these things for us. Well, in, I think it was maybe 99. So I would, when I would start doing these things, I would take the camera, meet with the utility, get them to install it. I was always out there with the crew. Half the time I'd get up in the bucket with them so I could test the equipment. But anyway, um, about 99 time frame, I think Tacoma was doing a wire down in Lewis County. And um, they, they, were, they wanted to put up some pole cams. And, uh, and, just, and just for the audience, a pole cam is basically a, a hidden camera that agents use out in the field to kind of monitor conduct surveillance in remote locations where they don't have to sit out there themselves. Right. So. Yeah. 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 So back in the, in the, this was microwave. Yeah. So you had to basically, you know, the camera is at a certain location. You've got a directional antenna that has to transmit that signal down the road somewhere to a receive site where you've got a VHS recorder 
on a time lapse recording 72 hours of video and somebody's got to change the tape. Right. So that was always, so there was always two parts to those installs. And uh, anyway, get out of Lewis County, go check out the target locations and um, try to get, I contact Lewis County PUD and say, hey, can you help us put these cameras up? Well, I got into with some asshole on the phone. He's like, no, we're not doing this or all right, you know. And I'm like, so I go back and I tell the case agent, I was like, yeah, it's not happening. And it will somehow, I don't know how this got escalated, but this is the story that I got, is that somehow this thing went up the chain and chief counsel's office from DEA counted, contacted the attorney for the utility and, uh, you know, had some discussion. And then the utility calls me back and the guy says, all right, we've decided you can put whatever you want on our polls, but we're not going to help you do it. So I was like, okay, okay, that's a start. And uh, interestingly, I had, I still had a lot of connections and hooks at Fort Lewis. And um, I knew a lot of people there from my time there. And I, of course, was a little bit well known. And uh, so I contacted um, Public Works at, um, at Fort Lewis because I needed a truck and I knew they had one. And uh, so I go, I go see the guy who's the deputy director of Public Works at Fort Lewis and uh, super nice guy. And he knew, he knew exactly what I was. And I kind of explained to him what I want. And he's like, yeah, I don't think, he says, no, that's, I think that's not a problem. And, uh, and he says, here's the deal. We use the truck from seven in the morning to three in the afternoon. You can come pick the tree up. You can come pick the truck up after three in the afternoon, but you have to have it back to us by seven in the morning. And we will make sure it's full of fuel when you come and get it. So I'm like, awesome. So now I got a truck. And, uh, so I would borrow the truck from Fort Lewis and I was my truck to start this thing. Now I'm, I'm probably the only guy that's got enough experience to actually get up in there. And I'd been up in the bucket, get up there, work on the power lines and hang them. Well, you know, there, there's, there's still a little bit of a learning curve and I was sort of stuck in the straightaway because I get up there, but I, I got attached to power and I would see how the utility did it, but I don't have the same tools as them. So I'm like, you know, and of course it's winter time, pissing down rain. And even though I'm wearing gloves, I'm wet, the gloves are wet, everything is wet, and I got a knife, and I'm trying to skin this energized line. And of course, every time I hit the bare metal, I'm getting zapped by this freaking thing. So I was like, ow, 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 ow. Okay, so no, no, wait a minute. So PUD tells you, we're going to allow you to do it, but we're not going to help. Yeah. So how do you get to the point where you have the knowledge to not get the crap electrocuted by you and not get killed while you're up there? Well, I didn't have all the knowledge. I only had about half the knowledge. I, I knew enough not to get me killed, but not necessarily enough that I was doing it correctly. <laughs> so there was a learning curve there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, so, but I got them installed. I mean, I, I put multiple cameras up down there and um, did all the receive sites and everything worked out really well. And um, funny thing is I had, I knew I needed more training. And so, as it turned out, uh, during the course of this investigation, about April time frame, um, I get the I get the nod from DEA. Hey, we're going to send you to tower climbing school at 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 the FBI's electronic research facility. And I'm like, cool, that'd be fun. And uh, so I get to Quantico, you know, the FBI facility, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, man. Of course, I'm thinking of the old days, you know. What was that guy's name? Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., the FBI, where they all drove Ford cars, you know, and they were like, it was awesome. No. You know, I, I got there, I, you know, and I, I, I can remember sitting in a class and talking to one of their, you know, premium, you know, uh, electronic technicians or whatever and uh, asking them some questions. And then afterwards, I asked this guy, I said, hey, don't you guys got some training in this kind of thing? He's like, fuck no. He said, he said, that kind of training is what gets people killed. And I said, no, not having training is what gets people killed. And uh, you know, funny thing is, you know, the FBI does not train in the rain. So if it rains, you can't climb towers. And, and while I was, the period of time that I was there, it rained several days. And, but I had access to all their reference material. So they got this whole wall of CRFs, Code of Federal Regulations. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to waste. I'm going to start reading. And so I would take these code of federal regulations and it turns out the, um, the 1929 CFR, no, no, 19, 
19, the 29 CFR, 1910, 269. Anyway, it's been so long. The Code of Regulation that covers power lines and utilities. So I got this book and it's, I read the whole thing and I highlighted all of the stuff that applied to work that we were doing. And then I, and I, and I studied, I learned it and I got every freaking regulation that had anything to do with this type of work. And I studied it and I learned it. And then, you know, I, I just made notes on it and um, kind of like trying to make myself a, you know, sort of a subject matter expert in it. And then Unfortunately, I had a good friend at utility and, you know, we talked and I got this guy to school me on some things. And um, so I, I felt like I was pretty comfortable. By this point, by the time I'm leaving school, you know, April time frame, I was pretty comfortable. And um, our supervisor at the time was a guy named um, Fred Thomas. And uh, he's like, hey, I want you to train some other guys in the group to do what you're doing. And I said, well, I said, I'm willing to train them. But if I train them, they're going to get trained right. I said, they're not going to start out the way I did. They're going to they're going to be trained to a certain standard because now I know what the standard is in the regulation. So they're going to be trained to meet this standard before we, you know, we go on. And he's like, absolutely. So I uh, um, I get I start working on the training and then I got a plan. And then I get contacted from this guy, Brian Castaldi, who is with NATIA, National Technical Investigators Association. And he's a Forest Service guy like out of Montana, but he's like the chapter president or something. He's some president of this Natia group. And he's like, hey, I heard that you're doing this kind of training and that, you know, would you be willing to train other people? Because there's a need for this. You know, th this is starting to become a more popular thing. There, there are more vendors that are manufacturing these type of pole cameras and microwave equipment. And, and it's starting to be used, utilized more and more in law enforcement. And I'm like, sure, sure, we could do that. And uh, so again, it was kind of funny. Again, you know, having the having the hooks at Fort Lewis, um, I decided the safe, safest way to get it done was I wanted to make it a resident course. That means you had to come to school and you had to stay there. And so we got rooms at the guest lodge. We had it on Fort Lewis. We used their facilities. We had trucks, and we started actually had a training area right there on the base. So we ran several classes at Fort Lewis. Got from. ATF and marshals and uh, all uh, different federal agents, state agencies, state patrol, whoever wanted to come, came and got training. And um, and we did it all right there on base. And um, and it went it went it was going super well. And, and, you know, the division was very, very supportive of this. I think John Bott was a sack at the time. It was like, absolutely. In fact, the initial certificates of completion came from the Seattle Field Division that you have. So anybody, whatever agency it was, anybody, the division was who issued the certificate of completion and you completed this training. So they were very, very much into it. And then um, as time went on, it got, it got big. And then Natia at the national level decided, Hey, we could, we, we, we can take this over and manage it. We can, cause I used to have to get like, if we had to rent trucks, I'd tell like the ATF, okay, you got to rent a truck and bring it. Or, you know, whoever, ate whatever agent, you run a truck and bring it. Yeah. So that's how, because we didn't have any money. DEA wasn't paying for shit except for allowing me to conduct the training. And anyway, then Natia took it over and uh, they had the means, you know, to manage all the, the, the funds. They had a way to bring the money in, collect money from the students, pay all the bills, buy the equipment and all that kind of shit. And all I had to do was show up and teach. Yeah. So, so Natia at the national level. Uh, took over management of the training. So anyone from any federal agency, state, local, would contact Natia. They would uh, they they would receive the money for buying tools and equipment, paying for trucks, whatever. Um, they would set up the training locations. So I just had to uh, show up. So it was we did it for 16 years, six times a year, different locations throughout the country. And uh, and as I learned, and so we're talking about federal agents, police officers, detectives, whatever, guys that had no experience in this whatsoever, knew nothing about, some of them knew nothing about electricity. You know, they're dealing with fears of heights, all kinds of things. So I have five days to take them from knowing nothing to being qualified to work in a high voltage environment. And as I, with experience in teaching, I learned, you know, some things that make it easier or more comfortable when you're taking somebody way outside their comfort zone. You know, when you're asking them to get into this bucket and go, you know, 30 feet up in the air and it's not a stable platform, that bucket is like, meh, 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 meh. you're like a clown on a stick. And uh, and then, you know, you're being like you're you're like this close to the power lines and you're deathly afraid of electricity. 
you know, how to teach them, you know, what's safe and what's not safe. And, 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 and in manipulating the mechanical aspects of manipulating the boom, like how do you get from here to there safely? And uh, so I would think of quirky things to say or um, ways to get people to remember. You know, because a bucket truck has an upper lift, a lower lift, and it extends, right? So there's a procedure. You raise the lower lift, you raise the upper lift, and the last thing you do is extend the boom out, right? But people would always fuck it up. They'd be up and down and they're all, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And so finally, I came up with a phrase to help people remember. And what I would tell them is, you must be fully erect before you squirt. And they were like, oh, so... In their brain, now they, something they can relate to. You must be fully, that lower boom must be fully erect before you squirt out. So, you know, anyway, everybody thought it was funny. It was a good thing, you know? And then, uh, and I had a bunch of other things like that that I would say. And I would joke around in class. We'd make pigtails. And, uh, you know, the pigtail is how you're attaching to the power line. Well, you know, there needs to be a separation in the line because you're going to go to two different places. And I'd be like, okay, you want to split the line to about six inches. And if you don't know what six inches is, reach into your pants and pull out a dollar bill. And, uh, and that's how, that's six inches, right? So they'd be like, oh. and then, but it would be funny because I'd walk around class and I'd see somebody and I can remember, because I'm, again, I'm, I treat everybody the same and I, and, and, and I would just joke with all of them. But I can remember one, picking up a guy's pigtail, black guy. And it was like this. And I pick it up and I look it up and I'm holding a class and I'm looking at this thing and everybody's looking at me and I look at him and I said, you know, I would expect it a lot more from a black man. <laughs> so, but, you know, so that kind of shit, but nobody cared. It was like, it was fun. You know, we're talking about cops, law enforcement, people that, you know, you better be thick skinned if you're going to show up here. So, so speaking of which, can you tell the story that we, we discussed about you installing one of the uh, pole cams? The? Well, the, the, and maybe it wasn't a pole cam, but it was the. Well, all right, all right. I have, one, I have a funny story to tell you okay. about what pole cans, and it, it, I know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. All right. So I would go wherever it takes, do whatever I had to do to get the job done. And there were times at the end of the year, like we didn't have any money for travel. And I might get a call from Eugene or say, say, hey, we need a camera here. And I, we got no money. You know, we got gas money and that's about it. No money for travel. And I'm like, fuck it, I'm going. And so I would get, I'd take my happy ass, get in the freaking truck and I would drive to Eugene even if I had to drive all day and all night, I'd go to Eugene and I would like do this install. And then coming back, I can remember one time coming back from Eugene, I had to stop in Portland and do a site survey. Now I'd been driving all night and now it's the next morning. And this is, I had long hair. I looked like shit. I was trying to look like a, you know, scruffy utility guy and uh, dressed crappy like a utility guy. And I can remember I parked, the, I parked the truck down the street and I had to do this site survey. So I parked the truck and I walked down to where I'm at. And, uh, and I'm looking at the pole that I think is going to be a target pole, a good pole for the camera. And I'm in some, in front of some kind of commercial looking building. I had no idea what the hell it was. I really wouldn't care. And there was a parking lot there. So I'm standing below the pole and I'm looking up and then I'm looking at the lines and I'm trying to identify the shit on the pole. So I'm kind of like spinning my, I'm kind of spinning around looking up like this, you know, and I'm looking up and I'm figuring out, all right, where the pole can is going to go, where I'm going to attach the lines. And I keep going around and around and around. And then I come back and I look and then I, I look into this parking lot and here's all these mentally disabled adults and they're all standing there looking up and they're spinning and spinning and spinning, you know, and I was like, ooh. And then all of a sudden, the short bus pulls in. And this thing was, it was the funniest damn thing. Bus, bus pulls in, and all these people start getting on the bus, and the black lady driving the bus. She looks at me, and I'm just standing there by the utility bowl. And she's like, come on, honey. It's time to get on to the bus. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I'm, no I'm not here for that. I'm, I'm like, no, no. And I was thinking to myself, any second, some guys are going to jump out in white coats, and they're going to grab me and throw me on the truck. I'll put me on the bus and I left my ID in the truck and I'll be like, no, no, I'm with DEA. No, I'm not supposed to be here. Sure, honey. Sure you are. You know, I was, I was like, oh, it was the funniest damn thing. But yeah, that was, that was kind of weird. But I had another experience. I had this really, Eric Christensen, great guy, great agent out of Portland, said he was having a problem working a case. And it's interesting, like over the years of trends and drug trafficking and how investigations worked and technology applied and all that kind of thing. It was really interesting over the years. But anyway, he's got this case where they um, 
And I, I'm the kind of guy that shit just pops into my head. I don't know where it comes from. And uh, so he's got this case where this, uh, they've got this little uh, Mexican tienda that their the primary target is dealing out of and his runners are meeting there. And, and he, they think kind of, because we've done this in the past, like break into a business, put in cameras and mics and monitor what's going, in, going on inside of business. That was something that we did. Uh, but not often, but common enough. We did it enough. And anyway, so they're thinking about they want to do this in this place. But every time they send somebody inside, they get busted. They're like, you know, they know it's a cop or whoever. And uh, he's like, Bill, I, I, I got to get this. I got to get this done. I need somebody on the inside. I got to figure out what's going on. And uh, I need something. And, and, and I want to film it. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a challenge. And I think about it for a second. He said, can you help me? And I'm like, sure. Yeah, and he said, uh, what are you going to do? And I said, just out of my head, I said, uh, I'm going to go in as a retard. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i I'll go in as a retard, and then no one will think that, you know, anything about it. And I said, I need you to get me a special person's TriMet bus pass, and I need this and that and that. And uh, it, 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 he's like, you're kidding. I'm like, no, no, no. And so I meet him down at Portland. And I'm dressed like a retard. I got pants that are too short. I got stupid looking shoes on. It's July. I'm wearing this, this like checkered wool jacket. I got a red t-shirt on underneath. Um, I got a beanie cap on. It's hot as fuck. And I, I went to the, to, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the dollar store and I bought the biggest freaking readers I could find, which are like 300 power. So I got these monster glasses on that are 300 power and it makes your eyes, you know, look huge. And, uh, but the funny thing is it disorients your equilibrium. So it already makes you kind of like retarded. And, uh, so I got, he, they fit, I had an agent alert. I had a, bo a buttonhole camera. I had a, a transmitter for audio. And uh, I'm like, I need, I want you to drop me down the street. I need to walk down there because I don't want anybody to see me. So I, uh, he drops me down the block and they have, they got, you know, uh, surveillance set up in the area close enough, you know, that they can hear and just keep an eye on things. Right. So I'm down the street and I walk in da, 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 and then all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm like, I got to pee. And so, but I'm in this whole, I'm in my retarded mode. So I was like, well, I can't get out of retard and go. So it's AM PM. So I go into the thing, you know, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, then they got a bathroom, you know, so I go into the bathroom and it was kind of funny. So I'm standing there at the urinal and, you know, at about a four foot and above was all mirror. Right. So I'm having my Truman moment. So with the glasses, so I'm standing there peeing, you know, and I forget about all the shit that I have. I'm standing there peeing and I'm looking at the mirror and I'm, I'm like, you are a handsome looking man. You, you, <laughs> I'm just talking to myself in the mirror, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I totally forgot about all that shit. So, but it was pretty funny. Anyway, I leave, I'm going to leave and, uh, and I get to the door and I can tell this, this, this woman coming in, who's just like a brute, you know, she's friggin' huge lady. She's like, rips the door open as I'm trying to come out and I'm kind of standing there like, uh, and then, and then she looks at me and I got my, I got my, uh, my, my little packet on. So I, I, I got this thing. It's like normally for carrying a passport, but it has some clear pockets in it. So I got my special needs TriMet bus pass in there. And then I had this other pocket. I was like, what the fuck am I going to put in there? So I'm searching my truck and I found one of those yellow bears from the brown bear car wash. So I stuck this bear in there and I thought this is perfect. And, uh, so she sees me and, I, and I'm all startled. And then she she goes, like, oh, come on, honey, get out, oh, come on, come on. Yeah. She just softened right up as soon as she saw this retard standing in the doorway. And then anyway, so I walk down the door, I walk down the street and, and, I, and I get to the door and I see a little sign on the door that says, everyone welcome. So I'm like, that's, that's me. So walk in, walk into the store, you know, and immediately they all look at me, you know, and I, 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 I miss my boss. I need to do some shopping. Yeah, I, I have my own money, you know, so I start walking around. And I'm trying to walk around so that the body worn camera I have is like filming everything on the inside. And, uh, and, and without being like too obvious, and I pick a few things up off the shelf and then, but I need to get to the other side where, you know, there's like cameras behind the counter. And, and, and so, but I gotta be able to like, you know, I'm trying to position myself. So behind the wall, behind, on the wall behind the counter, it's like all these baseball caps. It looked like Mexican NASCAR. I had no idea what it was. 
And uh, so I make my way over there. And then I'm kind of looking and I'm trying to position my body. And I'm looking at the hats and there's one at the far end. It was, I still have it. It was blue hat with a red and yellow sun. And I look at it and I'm, I'm like, I, I, I like that hat right there. You know, I, I, I like red. I like that hat red. I like that red. And, and what I'm doing is I'm like focusing on the hat and I'm like, keep walking into the counter so I can move myself down. And they're probably thinking, what a fucking retard. You know, there's a counter there, you know? And so I make my, move my way down and, and uh, anyway, I think I think I get everything, and then I go. I pick up a few items. One of the things I got, I buy. I want to buy things that a retailer would buy. So I saw this package of blue peeps. I thought that would be something I would buy if I was retarded. And uh, so I lay it on the counter, and I got the hat, and I think I got one other thing. And uh, so then I asked the guys, like, how much? And and he was like, you know, five ninety five. Or something like that. I mean, he just pulled that number out of his ass. I don't think they really sell anything. And uh, so the other thing I'd done is I took a whole bunch of $1 bills and I folded them into tiny squares in my in my little pouch thing there. And I, I hadn't shaved and I had a mustache and I basically looked like shit. And uh, so I pulling the dollar bills out and I have to unfold it. One, two, three. And I think because it was hot, you know, something, something made my nose started running. So then I'm standing there and I know, and, I, and then I, so I'm just like counting the money. And I'm like, <laughs> and the guy is like, I'm totally grossing him out, you know? And then, and then, and then I lost kind of like, uh, uh oh, and I got to start counting over again. I finally get $6 out on the counter. And the guy takes the money and he hands me a nickel and puts the shit in a bag. And then I, I, I walk out and leave and it was, oh my God, it was the funniest damn thing. But we got it done. And then, in fact, it was it worked so well. In September, they had another case, similar situation in Springfield, but a diff different store. But by this time, I had gone to Houston to teach a high voltage class. And as a joke, and I still have it, the guys in Houston gave me this big black Stenson hard hat. So it looks like a stupid looking giant plastic cowboy hat. So I think I'm adding that to my root. I'm adding that to my retard routine. So forget the beanie. I got this big black hat on and the glasses, same clothes, you know. So I walk into the store and it was so funny because there were there were three like high school age girls like up by the counter. And uh, so I'm kind of again, I'm trying to make the loop. And there was there was a there was a, a rack of cowboy hats kind of like up front. So I go and I look at the cowboy hats and I'm talking out loud and I'm loud, you know, and, and I like these cowboy hats, but I, I, I already have a cowboy hat. And I'm walking around. And then finally, I get up to where the girls are. And I stand there for a minute. I thought, you know, I'm a real cowboy. And they, they just look at me. And I thought, about it, and, I, and I have my own cowboy hat. But, but I can only wear the cowboy hat if I don't play with my penis. And these girls just bust up laughing. I don't know, I don't know how I maintain a straight face. And, I, and, then, I thought, and then I move on. And uh, I walk around, and uh, so I get the thing, get get the, get get everything covered. I think I got it covered. And I walk outside, and everything is cool. And uh, again, it was it was funny as shit. But you know, like a month later, they, I'm up in the up on the fourth floor of mahogany row, which I try to avoid like the plague. All the supervisors, the ASACs are in there. Selby Smith, who I knew pretty well, you know Selby. And uh, so I'm trying to get past this door with like nobody seeing me. No such luck. And so, uh, so all of a sudden, I get past it, but all of a sudden I hear Selby, Bill, Bill, come here. So I stop, I was like, oh shit. So I walk back and I'm standing in the doorway. I said, uh, I, yes. And he said, he looks back, he leans back and he's like, I just got one question for you. And I'm like, uh, okay, what is that? And he said, where's your cowboy hat? And I look at him and I said, you know the rule. <laughs> so... <laughs> 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 yeah, that was pretty funny. Uh, probably the only guy in DEA that ever went off, got off as a retard. But uh... okay, so Bill, so let's. I want to talk with you just about a couple things. We'll we'll kind of close it out. So <laughs> you worked on pole cams. You work on radios. What else did you do? What, what were kind of some of your own other functions as a tech agent? Uh, well, whatever, whatever, whatever the whatever the need was. I mean, it was the kind of job where it's something that I really liked. Where um, uh, well, a couple things I thought were interesting is that um, knock to knock leadership, but you can't ever ask for permission. You know, if, if there's something that we got to do, 
You just got to do it. If you know it's the right thing to do, if you got the skills, capabilities, you got the equipment, you just got to go do it. Because if you go to your supervisor and say, hey, I want to do this thing, and it's different, it's out of the norm, never been, never been done before, but you know it's going to work. But if you ask to ask permission, they're going to say no, because nobody, deniable, they did, nobody wants to accept responsibility. So I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to ask permission. I'm just going to go do the shit I need to do because all they care about is results anyway. So that, and then I, I was, I always did field work. So I had a reputation of getting shit done. So I would get calls all the time. I worked with state, local, federal, any agency, any department, anybody that needed my help, I was there to help them. And I was very, very fortunate that um, they allowed me to do it. No one ever said, no, you can't go work with them or you can't do this or that, you know, so that was pretty cool. But I mean, we did all kinds of shit. We would do like, you know, like say, you know, we'd break into a business and put in cameras and microphones and stuff like that. Um, stuff on boats or whatever, whatever the need was, trackers under cars, you know, it really, it kind of depended on, you know, as technology changed, because I can remember there was a time when um, Nextel had these phones that actually had the capability of GPS tracking. This is before they were really GPS trackers, but the phone could track. So we ended up take, getting some of these phones and we would set these phones up and had these cases made where you could actually take this Nextel phone and slap it onto somebody's car and you have, now you have a tracker. Where the, when we didn't have trackers, of course, now trackers are, you know, this big, but um, so that was, that was pretty cool. We did that, did a bunch of that. So whatever, we would just always try to take care of whatever emerging, te emerging technology was there and apply it. And then with, uh, you know, actually our buddy, John Satchel, he was like, I don't understand how I can go to that, uh, what's that, that, that uh, surf shop someplace and they would have like internet cameras and you could, laugh. he's like, how can they do that? And we can't do that. And then eventually we got to the point where we figured it out and it started, you know, with like, uh, um, like an eight by eight line. And then we went to like a, uh, a standalone DSL line on a utility pole. That was the first one to do that. I had a good guy at the, at the phone company back when it was Quest. And I, when we could use a DSL line and I would order a DSL line to be installed, terminated on a pole. And the, the technicians are like, the phone tech is like, why are we doing that there? And they'd be like, don't worry about it. So the phone, I'd have to order it up, DEA paid for it, and we would have a phone line terminated on a pole that was a standalone DSL. Mm. And we'd install that, we'd install in cameras that way. And then we then we started, we migrated into cable. You know, there was a great guy at Comcast that would help us do cable, actually gave us a handful of cable modems for free so we could test them. And uh, we, you know, we did a bunch of cable shit. And then eventually, you know, as cellular, it sucked at first. I mean, you just couldn't get any bandwidth on cellular, but now it's freaking screaming fast. So now a lot of shit is cellular. So essentially you were like, I mean, if I'm getting the, I think this is right. You were essentially like Q for James Bond. I mean, basically you're creating all this stuff. Anything, whatever they needed. How, Bill, how was it as a general rule? I mean, I know there's assholes out there right but as a general rule when an agent called you up how did they everybody treat you pretty well oh yeah absolutely okay yeah, yeah okay yeah I, I, yeah because i was i was you know there were there are maybe a couple people in a tech group that when they get a call from an agent they're kind of a dick you know and i was i'm not like that i'm here to help you know it goes back to the very beginning when i hired on you know it, i was absolutely committed there was i'm just going to do i was thankful for that job every day from the day i started to the day i left Plus, yeah. I assume that whoever's calling you is actually a worker and they need you and they understand your, your function anyway. Most of the time. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, you know how it is. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes no. you get the, you know, you know, remember Sheila Bond? I can remember Sheila Bond telling me. I couldn't understand how I could walk around the office when I, the rare times that I was in there and I'd see some people not just doing nothing. I was like, how does this happen? And she said, Bill, she says, let me tell you how it is. This is the rule. Big cases, big problems, little cases, little problems, no cases, no problems. And I, so, so you had people that were no cases, no problems, you yeah. know? So sometimes you, know, you get somebody that, that, you know, and, and if we had, if we had the, the, if we had, if we had the resources available, I, 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 a lot of times I'd be like, I know this is bullshit, but it was kind of like, you know, can I get, it was sort of a, can I get it done? Can I, can I do what they're asking me to do? If we had the equipment available, then I would, I would try to get it done. And, but if it got to the point where we're like, we need resources someplace else. And I know this is bullshit and their camera's been up for a year already and they've done nothing with it. I'd be like, Hey, we're taking your camera down. 
and we'd go move it someplace else. So, yeah, but it's just, yeah, it, it's <laughs> most of the time, you know, there were a lot of times when it was very significant and made significant contributions. Yeah. And other times, you know, uh, you know, somebody's just using it as an excuse. <laughs> okay, just one last question, one more story from you. Um, it was something that we talked about before. Now, I did 25 years, obviously, and I I was very, very fortunate that I had a lot of good supervisors. Now, I did have, I could probably name about three that were bad. Mm -hmm. But in 25 years, pretty good. Um, but I think the story that you told me is is kind of an epitome or kind of just kind of tells the story about how the bad supervisors were. So can you tell the story about um, just kind of the leadership thing where you go to Boise and, and you're going to get this stuff done, but you forget and then you come back and have a meeting with your Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had we had this uh, one particular supervisor. And again, like I said, most of the time, if I was going to do something, I, I would not, I just do it. I don't ask permission. I like they can figure it out later. And most time they didn't care. But um, so when when we were still on the early stages, you know, and and um, as I plan a trip to someplace, I would think in my head, right, I, I would try to take everything that I thought I could possibly need. But because of technology and just, you know, circumstances, location, whatever, there may be something that I don't have. And so you've got a whole group of people, like seven people sitting on their asses in the office in Seattle. And I'm freezing my butt off in, in Boise, Idaho. And, uh, you know, and I just drove straight through to get there. But uh, so I call back to the office and um, the one particular guy that I used to seem to get on the phone all the time would uh, he was sort of he was supposed to be kind of in charge of shipping and receiving basically you know and i'd be like hey i need i i would know exactly where it was i knew exactly what i wanted and i'd be like and i knew what time fedex picked up and i'm like you got plenty of time and i call this guy up and i'm like hey i need you to go get this item put it in a box and ship it to me in boise and i need it tomorrow morning and he'd come back we'd be like well, I'm, I'm I'm a little busy right now, you know. Or can it wait? I'm like, fuck no, it can't wait. I'm in fucking Idaho, man. And uh, I'm like, you better. I'm like, you better, you better stop what you're doing and get this shit done. And uh, you know, so it, I'm like, motherfuckers. So fortunately, they they'd get it done. But um, so one time, the supervisor, you know, we had we had a pretty big tech group at the time. And he liked to sit down and have these like happy little round robin circle jerks. And everybody talks about their happy little life and all the shit that they're doing with DEA. And most of it was all bullshit. And uh, I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, like, why, why I'm wasting my time in this fucking meeting? And uh, I listen to all these happy little stories. And then he finally gets around to me. And I'm like, I don't want to be there anyway. But I'm like, all right, you want to know what's going on? And I said, the problem with me is, I said... I'm perfectly capable of doing the things that I need to do. But I said, sometimes I need support. And, uh, you know, being my background as a ranger, whatever, you know, I might drop the F-bomb a few times, you know. So I'd be like, I'd start on my rant. I don't get any fucking support out of you people. I call into the fucking office and I need you to send me a fucking item and I need it the next fucking day. And I'm going to, you know, and then like you guys are just fucking sitting on your asses. And I, I, so I go on this rant and I look over at him. He's got his little steno pad and he's, I think he's taking notes writing about what I'm telling him. And then I finally, I get to the point and I'm like, all right. And he looks at me and he said, is that it? And I said, yeah, that's it. And he looks at his steno pad and he looks at me and he said, do you know you said fuck 21 times? And I'm like, I, after all that, that's what you got out of this? That I said fuck 21 times? Well, fuck, make it 22. You know, and I, I was like, oh, this is stupid. I just realized, you know what? That's a, it's a different world. It's not a that's the day that's a different world that they live in, and I'm out here. And I, you know, I was very I'm very lucky, very thankful that you know my entire career I did field work. I can remember on my 64th birthday, I'm hanging a freaking pole somewhere around here. It's pissing down rain, sideways wind. You know, I mean, it just absolutely sucks. And, I, and I'm up there trying to install this freaking camera. And I think to myself, you know, if somebody had told me 20 years ago that this is the kind of shit I'd be doing when I'm 64, I'd be like, there's no fucking way. But there I was. In fact, I, I had to take a selfie 
to remember that moment. <laughs> so, but you know, hey, it was I, 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 I very, very thankful, you know, for the job I had every day. Met, met so many great people, and I think I, I think I was able to make some, you know, significant. I got a whole freaking wall of those plaques upstairs, you know, it was like. You know, so fortunately, along the way, they, they, they were, there were people that recognized good effort. And uh, after the fact, they don't want to know ahead of time. But afterwards, you're okay. Don't ask for permission. Don't ask permission. Because they'll tell you no. Yeah. Bill, that's a great way to end it. I really appreciate the, no the uh, interview. Thank you very much. Absolutely. No problem.